I've been doing this little web series for a long time, and I'm always on the lookout for new and interesting games that fell through the cracks of the public eye. And that's getting harder and harder to do these days, not just because there's so many indie games out there, but simply how indies are starting to get a good amount of press through various news sites and other YouTubers giving them exposure. But sometimes it's really surprising going on Steam Spy and finding really quality games that nobody bought. This is a sub-series I've wanted to do for a very long time. Games that for whatever reason have been simply overlooked, or those that I've felt are much better than what popular opinion has dictated. While most well-known and liked games can have anywhere from hundreds of thousands of owners to over a million owners, I wanted to keep this series to games that are just under 20,000 owners according to Steam Spy, or it's only available on lesser-known sites like itch.io, and it's safe to assume it didn't really find a large audience. Either that or games that I feel have gotten a bit of a mixed reaction that are a little bit better than what popular opinion has dictated. So let's take a look at a few hidden gems. In my search for oddball games out there, you start to find a lot of samey, overdone art styles that starts to make everything almost mesh together. I still really enjoy gorgeous pixel art games, hell this video itself features a few, but even I'll admit it's starting to become a bit overdone. So when I got an email recently about a brand new game not only based but using classical renaissance era paintings as the basis for a point and click adventure game, it certainly stands out from the crowd. Four last things from Joe Richardson came from Game Jolt's Adventure Jam in 2016 of the same name that took a lot of judge and audience awards. From there, a modest Kickstarter was created to give a now larger release onto Steam, which is the version that I got to play. Knowing absolutely nothing about this project going in, this was a pleasant surprise that left me walking away smiling. You play as a man who wants to confess his sins at a church, but can't get inside on the weird account that he didn't sin in their jurisdiction. So the church proposes to him to go around town and commit all seven deadly sins again on their turf in order to gain entry and atone for everything in a package deal. He's already sinned, so just add more and we'll redeem the old and the new ones at once. That's how religion works, right? It's heavily drawing influence, or should I say using the work of Hieronymus Bosch and his painting, The Seven Deadly Sins and the Four Last Things, there being the main inspiration for the game. Bosch's work is used throughout the game, as well as whenever you complete one of the seven main sins. If you have no knowledge of these paintings or others from the era, the game provides an entire room full of all of the paintings for your own convenience. This room itself is even taken from an original classic painting. It's hard to get more meta and paintception than that. The creator Joe Richardson clearly spent a lot of time photoshopping all the settings and landscapes, to create the full town here, making a weird remix of all the busy, quirky, and highly detailed characters that came from this era. He also shows off his skill as a Photoshop artist by combining different styles and characters to make different paintings blend together with one another. It's a sort of Monty Python spoof on the strange and bizarre imaginations from the time period, contrasting the highbrow reputations these paintings have with the at times nonsensical reality is part of the joke. The puzzles in the game only had one or two different cases of moon logic to solve, but for the most part it is fairly easy to figure everything out here and to progress with the game. The jokes in the game did merit the occasional chuckle, and the puzzles offered the same satisfying feeling of outsmarting it that adventure games are best at. It is a somewhat short affair, clocking it at about two or three hours to beat depending on how good you are at these kinds of games. It is short, but it wraps up its story very, very nicely, where it doesn't feel like it has any unnecessary extras. Four Last Things may not be as much of a masterpiece as the work that it's parodying, but I had a short but sweet time with it, and you might too. So this game's a little bit more well-known these days. Originally, it sold for only a few thousand copies according to Steam Spy for the longest time, but I'm assuming through a Humble Bundle or a Steam sale, it now has a nice 50,000 owners. Unfortunately from that, it's gone from mostly positive reviews to only mixed reactions on the Steam page. The rating comes from some reported bugs with others having control issues, and to be honest, I only played this on the PlayStation 4 and Vita, so for this video I'll be referring to the good old Sony version. 
I'm such a dork for this game that I went and got almost all of the high score trophies on PSN, and I even made sure to get the limited run copy of the game when I had a chance. Its simplicity won't be for everybody, but it sure as hell worked on me. Curses and Chaos is a one-screen beat-em-up game where you, or a partner, team up to take out different enemies in 10 different ways. They come in various patterns where you have a punch, air attack, and access to various attack items that enemies drop. Each wave has a timer of 60 seconds, and when it reaches zero, death will show up and you'll have to take out the remaining baddies before the Grim Reaper one-hit KOs you, taking out a life. It's a very simple game, but it encourages high-score runs in a chain without getting hit that will result in better items being dropped and a higher score. Then you start to learn different moves, like the air attack and the charge attack are twice as powerful as a regular punch, and then when balancing out and waiting for the right time to use whichever item you picked up, and moving around for the right attacks while timing your adversary's moves had me sucked in this game for hours. Its tight, responsive controls never made me think twice or blame the game for screwing up, and I got better and better as I played it. Don't be fooled by the game's trailer, showing it off as a local multiplayer game. I got through the main game on my own, and with some practice and a little bit of patience, I went through the game no problem. It also has a shop and crafting system, where the items that were dropped can be combined to make more powerful items, including the Elixir of Life, the main item you'll need to get rid of the curse, which is part of the game's store. And if you're not doing well in a level later on, you may want to grind on a previous level, boosting yourself up and getting a strong item. This is one of the few things people complain about the game, where it is a bit of a grind to find these, but I didn't mind grinding, as it helped me practice in the game, and again, helped me hold my skills. It's a tense and rewarding feeling to get your combo counter in triple digits, knocking out one high score after another. Granted, some of the middle levels did take me a bit longer than a few of the later ones with some of the baddies. The difficulty curve may vary for new players coming in. Its pacing is just right here, offering you a good amount of fodder while you're waiting, and while you're waiting for the next wave to do, you can, uh, boost your score. The game does offer the option to play online with a friend, or to be able to find a random person online to play with, but unfortunately I've tried this twice without finding anybody else to play with on the PlayStation Network. However, I tried it again recently, and it works no problem! Thanks PlayStation Plus promotion and Boondock Saint 420. Tribute Games has a good reputation of highly detailed, colorful sprite art, and Curses lives up to those high standards. Its soundtrack and sound design are also no slouch, with really driving, energized music and satisfying sound effects. Now this is a very, very simple game, and there may be those that are against this simply because of its simplicity, but man, did this magic work on me. I know this game has some very mixed fans from those that have played it, if you've never heard of it or are a bit of a skeptic, I highly encourage you to looking into Curses and Chaos. Now when finding hidden gems, it's very hard to do it alone, so this time I wanted to bring on a very special guest, a very, very dear friend of mine, Mr. Alex Fasciani. You may know him from Super Beer Bros and the National Dex. Alex picked and wrote this entire piece. I hope you enjoy it. These days, as AAA games are pulling out every last bit of spectacle and technical wizardry they can to justify their own dwindling existence, I sometimes find it hard to remember the days when I could be transported and moved by older, more lo-fi games. I am known by reputation to be something of a retro gamer, whatever that means, but even then, the melodramatic, winking tone of classic games from the 80s and 90s, your Ultimas, your Dragon Quest, your Chrono Triggers, while very good at reminding me of my childhood, have lost their ability to affect me the way they may be used to. But honestly, I can't even remember if that ever was the case. Our memories of these games degrade with our own memories, and unlike movies, which we watch in the same order every time, feel like things we actually did once upon a time. The crystal, the monster, the princess. We feel like we were actually there for all of it. Sometimes we even think about mistakes we've made playing games, what we might do differently. Confident that when we walk away, the world we walked away from would still be there waiting for us, in some form, forever. But as we have all probably experienced at some point, this isn't necessarily true, and something as simple as a dead battery or a line of corrupted code in our world can instantly and permanently change these fantasy worlds we remember as living, breathing places, where we played and adventured for like 10 years into an empty wasteland, just like that. Boop. Gone. 
Now, I know it sounds a little sappy when I spell it out and dress it up in pretty words like this, but that right there is the exact kind of feeling this free little 10 minute twine game can give you, and that's either gonna turn your head or it isn't, but you at least gotta give this game points for cleanly tackling some pretty heavy metaphysical themes in a mature, surreal way that's super relatable to the intellectual MS-DOS floppy disk high fantasy RPG playing set. At the risk of misleading you, this game is not essential playing by any means. It also isn't very socially relevant or even all that actually truly fun to play, but it's cool as hell and it's engaging and it captured my imagination and it made me feel cool for playing it. And if you're down as I am for a neat little self-contained experience you can stimulate your neat art brain with while getting weird with your favorite abusable substance, check out Forgotten by Sophia Park. It's free, dummy. So you may remember a few weeks back that the humble Freedom Bundle was a massive success giving a six million dollar f*** you to the travel ban supporting some good causes. I was one of the donors beefing up my Steam collection with a wide range of different games. And the process of me making this video has been slowly playing all the games one by one that I've never heard of. Without a doubt one of the most pleasant surprises from this collection is a little game called Ellipsis. It's a PC port of a mobile game that didn't review that favorably simply because of its controls and how your finger gets in the way of the action. Thanks to the bundle, this game went on selling from only 2,000 copies to just under 100,000 according to Steam Spy. But considering that this bundle came with games like The Witness, Stardew Valley, and a heck of a lot more, it's safe to assume that Ellipsis wasn't one of the main selling points of the deal. If it's just sitting in your Steam library from the bundle and you haven't tried it yet, then you are in for a real treat. It's a minimal dodge everything game done in sort of a vector graphic style where the goal is to touch specific blue rings and make it to the goal. The blue rings contain small circles that you can collect and boost your ranking for the level, giving a simple risk versus reward system, including a fifth circle which is optional in order to clear the level. There's a large number of different rooms to clear, each having a variety of different stuff to dodge, from bullets, to ships, to bombs, to doors, to lines, to everything. It's all explained without any dialogue, and teaches you the mechanics with just a circle and some very, very smart level design. Its use of black space, pitch perfect controls, and the levels build up with more and more baddies and obstacles to help keep it fresh. It has a fantastic sense of flow as transitioning in and out of levels, and even when you screw up, it doesn't break that flow and lets you get right back into it. It even has different levels of control with different low gravity rooms mixing up the gameplay. This is the kind of game where you can screw up a ton of times and then slowly memorize the levels for a just one more try mentality. It never felt frustrating in the sense of throwing a controller in anger from bad level design, but instead of, man, I could have done better and will do better this time. Okay, maybe this time. Okay, maybe this time. It's great. Legitimately up there with Super Meat Boy and being tough, fair, and addicting. There are a few minor issues. Some of the levels require you to act immediately before being killed by a baddie, but it is made to be reloaded right away, and it's only a minor gripe. Granted, some of the later levels might have you pulling your own hair out in terms of its difficulty, but it has an appropriate difficulty curve to get you there along the way. If the healthy amount of levels weren't enough for you, the game even comes with its own level builder with Steam Workshop support. There have been a few levels created from it already, so there's a dedicated community starting to build up with it. If you are one of the many people who picked up the Humble Freedom Bundle, pause this video and start downloading this right now. But if you haven't heard of this game or missed the bundle, Ellipsis comes highly recommended. Minimal gameplay at its absolute finest, and even outside of being a gem, it's one of the best indie games of 2017 so far. Really enjoyed this game. Anybody who knows my channel knows that I absolutely love Cave Story from Studio Pixel. This one-man developed game displayed a high level of quality with its difficulty curve, level design, boss design, and a lot of heart. Cave Story has become a pantheon title within indie gaming, and it's been cited as an inspiration for many other developers. So you may think that Pixel's game after that Kiro Blaster could never really be a gem. A world-renowned developer's follow-up has to be a really popular game, right? Well, it might surprise you to learn that in the two years since its Steam release, it hasn't broken over 20,000 owners. Cave Story, by comparison, has over 770,000. Even though this came from mobile, and there are probably more users on that platform, 
Surprisingly, Hero Blaster is a gem. It's as simple as a platformer gets, but this is now my third time playing through the whole game, and it still hasn't gotten old. As a simple custodial scientist working for Cat and Frog Inc., you have to venture out across the world and clean up different CF stations from Black Triples. And that's it! It's a very simple story, but it has such a great amount of charm with its cutscenes and banter between its different characters that give them a lot of, well, character. One or two of the characters do have different arcs about them, but this is a perfect example of execution outdoing the general idea. The game itself is an action platformer where you take out different baddies with a variety of different weapons, each having different patterns and damage points. You can aim up, left, and right to take out the different baddies, and can collect coins from fallen enemies to upgrade your arsenal's powers and patterns. The game has a fantastic difficulty curve of having easy levels early on, and the right level of challenge for the later levels. The soundtrack has a lot of strong melodies and satisfying sound effects, and the boss fights have a great amount of variety and challenge. So much of the charm that made Cave Story a now classic title are on full display with Kuro Blaster. I suspect that one of the reasons it remained at gem status is that it is an admittedly simple game. Jumping and shooting are essentially all you'll be doing in the game, and it's relatively short length of about 2 or 3 hours to beat, so while the level design has some solid variety, gameplay wise it's essentially the same throughout the game. And to be fair, there is a hard mode you can unlock after beating the main game, giving it a bit of extra value. To me, however, the experience trimmed the fat from itself, and the levels were given such a great amount of attention in their design. They're all short, but very memorable. Kiro Blaster is an incredibly humble game. It doesn't try to impress with a flashy art style. It's not experimental, it's not pretentious. It's not bigger, better, or more badass. It's just a simple, fun platformer with all the minimal charm you come to expect from Pixel. It's a game that feels right from 2006 on some random game jolt page that nobody paid attention to. And if you're still not convinced, you can even try out Pink Hour on Steam. It's a free prologue chapter of Hero Blaster, giving a good showcase for the game. And Hero Blaster got released for the PlayStation 4 very recently, so if you don't want to play games on your computer, that's the version to go with. Hero Blaster, to me, is a reminder that a minimal approach from a small team of developers can still be a blast to play. It's absolutely within the original spirit that made me start this entire web series in the first place. So there you have it, five new games that you may or may not have heard of. Everything shown off here is in the description below. This was a fun video to make and to hunt for different games, so if you enjoyed this video, please sound off in the comments and I'll be happy to make more. A big thanks to Alex Fossiani for being part of this video. You can check out the National Dex and Super Beard Bros and find them on the Twitters at Fossiani A. My name is Mark and you can see all sorts of other videos here and subscribe. Thanks for watching.